start with a, a shortish recap and then see how much we get to today. So we're basically putting forward and exploring, elaborating a little bit uh, soul-making practice, soul-making dharma, sensing with soul as an approach to ethical practice and ethical philosophy, to uh, working with but also thinking about ethics. Actually, I do feel that that was implicit in the Sila and Soul talks, but I, as I said, I felt I was a little too restrained there and uh, a little too held back, modest. I think, modest on, on behalf of Soul Making Dharma, I think um, I also have a tendency uh, to assume that what is implicit in what I say or write will be uh, understood by anyone sort of listening or reading or by most people listening or reading and um, that's really a, a, not a very good assumption it's a naive assumption um, so it's kind of what I learned from writing seeing that freeze um, a, a lot of stuff is just I thought obvious conclusions to make or implicit or one could put make the connections by oneself, it didn't need me to spell them out, but that was clearly um, almost uh, almost entirely uh, not true, not the case for people. But anyway, so um, just trying to redress that a little bit and hopefully uh, be more helpful in opening things up. So, recapping. Sensing the soul as an approach to ethical practice and philosophy, and putting that forward and seeing what, what that might offer. And we said, uh, one of the things we started with last uh, in the last talk was that, you know, can we expand the notion of what we're actually talking about here, what ethics is, um, excuse me, what we need to do um, in thinking about ethics and approaching ethics. Because usually, or very commonly these days, ethics is thought of and approached as a sort of the philosophy or a set of guidelines or laws or prescriptions for what to do. What should I do? What ought I to do in this or that situation? So we want to include that, of course, those kinds of questions and ways of approaching those questions. What should I do here? What ought I to do? But include it in a much larger uh, question and exploration, which is, what is of value? Cause, cause I'm, not, I'm not the first person to, to kind of uh, insist on this expansion. Just in modern times, Hartman would say, you know, before you can answer the question, what ought I to do? You have to answer the question, what is of value? Right? You need to understand this. It's really important. Think this through if it doesn't make sense. What is of value in life? What, uh, not just what should I do, but what is of value? What should I love? Because it's valuable, or highly valuable, or ultimately valuable. And in that, uh, that will imply, it will suggest to me, it will direct me in terms of what I should do, to a large extent. So we have Hartman and we have Charles Taylor, who I mentioned the other day, who says, you know, about expanding the, um, the exploration from the, uh, what, from the ought to do, to the good to be or good to love. So not, not just what ought I to do, but what, what is it good to be as a human being? And what ought I to love? What is it good to love as a human being? What should I love? So this is really, really uh, important and crucial, I think, to opening up ethics so that it becomes a much more fertile uh, area and more dynamic in, uh, instead of something that just sort of grinds to a halt or two opposing parties just shouting louder and louder at each other from opposite poles of you know some ethical debate whatever that is 
So what's happened is that this question of uh, what is it good to be, what, what ought I, what should I, what is it good to love, um, what makes life worthwhile, what is it to live a really worthwhile life, that question uh, became separated out from the question, what is it right or wrong to do in a certain situation, or across the board in all situations. So philosophy has stopped posing that first question. What is it good to be? What is it good to love? What should I love as a human being? What is a worthwhile life? And so certainly it can't give, it doesn't, it doesn't even attempt to give any answers because it's stopped asking the question. It's deemed that question um, irrelevant uh, to ethics and it's not included in ethical philosophy or very rarely. And then, and then gradually, it's, 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 gradually, one either philosophers or students of philosophy, and then ordinary people, people on the street, it's hard for them to even see a connection between those two questions. What is it good to be and good to love, and what ought I to do, and what's right or wrong in a, in a, in a certain situation? They even see a connection there. So if, if if it's not obvious, do you think it through, and ho- hopefully it will get more obvious as we're talking, but but, but it's a saying on a recent retreat, to think on your toes, meaning engage. Actually, uh, we learn a lot more when we're when we think actively. So with all that and with the you know, as as the years of modernity um, uh, grew, went on, and then postmodernity, etc. If we call that, and um, then almost agreed upon in in modern modern uh, or the cultures of modernity, that we cannot, no one can impose uh, X or Y, this or that, uh, regarding what people should strive for, or what they should aspire for. We cannot, that cannot be imposed universally by anybody, or it cannot be even imposed on anyone else. Not, not even that it can't be imposed universally, it can't be imposed by any individual on another individual anymore. That uh, brings with it a, a great freedom. We're not all obliged to follow the same view about uh, what is most worthwhile. What's the thing we really should be aspiring for? This is really better, and if you're if you're kind of not up to it, or a little bit weak, or a little bit stupid, you don't really get that. So you settle for a second class life, in some sense. So we have the gift of a great freedom these days because there is this. Uh, uh, if you like, imposition of the. Of the rule that we can't, one, no one can impose uh, what we should strive for or, or should aspire for. What is the best thing? So we have the, a kind of imposition um, about barring an imposition, and there's a freedom. There's a great freedom for us that's opened up. A great space, multi-directional possibilities uh, that have, have opened up for our life, for how we construe our life. Um, because of that, because of that, um, uh, that uh, debarring and disallowing of any imposition from anyone uh, onto anyone. Of course, in in other religious cultures, some still around, that's much less the case. So this is not, and then there's there's a lot of in between areas as well. But certainly in secular. Um, secular dominated society, that is the case. Uh, but there's a lot of grey areas. Societies that are sort of religious in some ways, or sort of religious in some ways, and very secular in other ways, is quite common these days. So it brings a freedom, but also brings massive, massive problems. Huge, uh, wide and deep problems. And I'll come back to that. But just just, just to get a sense of this, um, if, if you're not... Uh, qu- quite sure that you understand this or you, or you get what it's pointing to, just compare, notice how acceptable it is and how common it is to argue uh, for some people uh, or one person or a group of 
with people to argue with another person or another group of people, argue and accuse them of doing something ethically wrong. And then the other person arguing back or whatever. That that's, um, okay, it's often unpleasant, but it's a perfectly acceptable thing to do in our society and it's, um, and it's, and it's really quite common. It goes on all the time, of course. But consider how unacceptable it is and how very uncommon it is to accuse another or others of living a life or lives that are not worthwhile. You're not allowed to do that. So I look at your life and it's just, actually, you're really not living a life that has, has any uh, deep meaningfulness. It's not a worthy life. It's not a worthwhile life. This is not acceptable to say to someone. And it's, and it's very, very uncommon to actually say it to someone. It's even less probably uncommon to even think it. Because we, we're barred from that kind of view. It would be unheard of someone say, well, I see you have family and you have kids and you're, you look after them and you have fun and um, and you have lots of, you know, experiences and you travel and uh, you're relatively kind, but actually it's kind of meaningless. It's not, it's not a worthwhile life, what you're living this is completely uh, unacceptable in our society and pretty much unheard of. This gives you a sense of uh, the, d- the divorce here and the division of these two questions, how far it's gone in our society. So what happens is that um, this, this first question about a worthwhile life, about what's good to be and good to love, what ought I to love, what should I aspire to, What's the mo- the best thing to aspire to? Um, this is actually uh, forgotten, and often then uh, it's not given attention. The question is forgotten, and it's not given attention to. And on a social level, what you then get is a kind of directionless society, without any basis or substantial basis or deep uh, deep soil deep fundament of basis um, to on which to erect an ethics or even decide about ethics and as more and more the advances of, advances of technology and consumerism and uh, global population and globalization um, foist on us thrust on us different ethical <clears throat> um, uh, emergencies, dilemmas, situations that need response, and we have less and less of a soil, of a foundation on which to grapple with such issues. So, on a social level, on a on a, on a societal level, um, we get a kind of rudderlessness. Not only without rudder, we are without even any training in how to use a rudder. And so, but it's generally said well, people kind of people should decide that question for themselves about what's what's worthwhile, what it's good to be, what it's good to love, to aspire for, to strive for, what's a really meaningful life. But what does that decide for themselves really mean? Is it is it is it something that they really really ponder with all their heart and mind and soul? Decide for themselves. We decide for ourselves, or do we just kind of not think about it much or think about it a little bit in our teens and then kind of maybe get pulled by something, following something, as uh, colleagues are just following the Vedana, following the pleasant Vedana, avoiding the unpleasant. What, what actually happens to that whole question? And it's quite interesting. It, it's, it's not black and white. You know, so some people, yeah, you ask them, what, what, what's a beautiful life, as I asked in the, in the Sealer and Soul Talks. When you think of a beautiful life, or the good life, 
yeah, it's good to be rich, it's good to be handsome or beautiful, it's good to be popular, maybe even famous if I can, it's good to have this and that and other material things, and it's good to have and get pleasant and interesting experiences and travel and all that. That would be one answer. Slightly, or, you know, uh, more, more, uh, an answer with more kind of consciousness, uh, life, more from a life of consciousness would maybe answer something like, or, or it's not even an answer, it's more like uh, a way one is living. It has become incorporated into the direction and the choices of one's life to a certain extent. So one might say, for instance, spiritual practitioners, Buddhists, etc., might say, well, it's good, it's good, it's good to be kind. It's good to be a warm person. It's not good to be arrogant. It's good to be helpful um, to the world in some way. It's good to be relatively confident so that I can actually, you know, manifest um, that kindness and warmth and help. So what we... Um, Recognize there is the language of values and virtues and the ideas, but they're only kind of half anchored in uh, in a dimensionality. It's just good to be those things. It's it's appealing to be kind, warm, not arrogant, helpful, relatively confident. So the language of values and virtues and and, and those kinds of ideas, but it's only half anchored in dimensionality. And therefore it's only kind of half-hearted. Yes, this person might appear kind and warm and not arrogant and helpful and relatively confident and all those things. This person has done, done that, achieved that. It's good. Maybe it took them a little work. Maybe not so much. But there's something... Because it was only half-anchored, only half-rooted... In, in a deep dimensionality. It's only half-hearted their attitude to those values and virtues. It's only half-souled. S-O-U-L-E-D. Or there may be, you know, and or, there may be a kind of dim or vague sense of the dimensionality and divinity of those uh, values, virtues, qualities, kindness, warmth, um, let's put it in a positive, say, you know, relative humility, helpfulness, confidence. So there's maybe a dim or vague sense of their dimensionality or divinity, but, but n neither the conceptual framework around their dimensionality nor the eros in relationship to them, and those things are completely related, the conceptual framework and the eros, neither the conceptual framework nor the eros are allowed to operate fully, possibly for all kinds of different reasons, a block to the eros, a, a conceptual framework uh, that one hasn't troubled to, to think through because one's just adopted bits and bobs of other conceptual frameworks and sort of has a bit of a hodgepodge that remains a bit incoherent and therefore uh, not as powerful and as galvanizing and as delivering as it could be. This is actually relatively common, relatively common among people who would consider themselves, for example, you know, Buddhist practitioners, etc., What's rarer uh, among Buddhists, certainly in the West, is is um, uh, another type, um, or another kind of response to all this. Um, it's rarer, but it exists in certain, let's say, Abhidhamma-dominated um, uh, schools of Buddhism. So if a, even a Western practitioner has kind of been saturated uh, or, or kind of open to that so much it begins to really pervade their way of thinking, then they do think a lot perhaps about... Um, uh, when you think, what's the good life? What's the what's a really worthwhile life? It's with a maximization of positive qualities of the chitta, um, with a maximization of mind moments of positive qualities. This mind moment of kindness, this mind moment of um, helpfulness, this mind moment of compassion, etc. 
and a minimizing of negative qualities or minimizing of mind moments dominated by negative qualities as they're classified by the Abhidhamma. And the whole way of thinking about the thing is, is as if it's some kind of mechanical system. Um, and so these people are much less rare in certain insight meditation circles. In other insight meditation circles, you'll come across them quite a lot. So it depends what circles you move in. Um, but it could well be that someone listening to a person like that is actually a little... Um, it, it sounds almost scary. It's It sounds so one-dimensional. Um, uh, a kind of machine-like... Uh, notion, logos of the human being, and this is supposed to, this mechanical system of sort of maximizing the positive mind moments and minimizing the negative moments is supposed to somehow deliver us to Nibbana. And a person can come away and feel like, whoa, this, it, they're making all the right noises as far as Buddhist philosophy uh, is concerned, I guess. They're making you know, it kind of gels with the teachings, but there's something almost ghoulish about it, uh, you know, ghost-like almost, monstrous, inhuman, Frankenstein-like. There's something hollowed out in the human being there. This is somehow not a beautiful life. Somehow it's almost not quite human. And for all the sort of, um, what sounds like carefully, uh, precisely incisive talk about essentially about virtues. and so This uh, it sounds like a very careful, discriminating, precise um, intelligence at work somehow also sounds in, in some kind of um, sparklingly stupid um, in some way. Or, you know, the whole thing, this whole talk about worthwhile life and values and virtues and Aspiration, strife can just go for a person right into the inner critic. And the inner critic can just um, appropriate that whole, uh, those whole, uh, that whole set of ideas and that whole question and just um, turn on oneself and attack one, attack, the inner critic attacks, attacks the being in that way. And the whole thing just gets very tight, very contracted, very um, self depreciating and self destructive. Also, um, not very soulful at all, just as that um, uh, certain kinds of abhidhamma dominated Buddhists might come across as what we would call extremely unsoulful. Um, sim- similarly, um, with someone who's not even thinking that way can just, uh, said the inner critic, the inner critic can just hijack the whole conversation, and that's not soulful at all. But this divorce, this split, and then as a jettisoning and forgetting, or ignoring, or a kind of um, uh, uh, debarring from approaching this first question. About what is it good to be? What is a worthwhile life? What is a beautiful life? What is of, of utmost value, etc.? This, uh, that, uh, you know... Um, as I said, this, this debarring from approaching that, that, that relegating of that, forgetting of that, or, or only kind of um, half-heartedly um, thinking about and including that. This, I think, is part a part of the wider and deeper great crisis of modernity and post-modernity. So we can easily talk, or nowadays in our modernist and postmodernist culture we can easily talk about the need to reduce suffering but how do we calculate that how do we compare different sufferings different kinds of sufferings what even are the different kinds of sufferings that's related to what are the different kinds of of value of meaningfulness how do they stand in relationship to each other and you can talk again, and it sounds very good, um, wanting to reduce suffering or um, wanting to, you know, um, support human flourishing. That's another kind of uh, modernist and postmodern trope, even. 
human flourishing. What on earth does human flourishing mean? What does it mean? Unless we, unless you're talking about just biological survival, which a question of, well, um, we don't, we can't, we can have a very poor uh, understanding of what human flourishing means, good as it sounds, and important as it sounds, and sort of wondrously um, enlightened and noble and modern as it sounds. But unless we actually go into this question of what is a value, what is really good, what is the ultimate good, what makes a life really worthwhile, we cannot possibly um, decide what human flourishing involves. So, that's one uh, one big need, is to expand the conversation. So there's two questions, <clears throat> not just what I ought to do, but what it's good to be, and good, and what maybe I ought to love, are uh, included and put together, and, and the, the uh, uh, one is a subset of the other. And the second thing we talked about um, uh, was just what would be a list of... of wishes or needs for an ethical system to be incorporated into ethical practice. Um, and I ran through a list of, depending on how you count it, six or seven, so if we include this expansion of the excuse me, of the domain of what ethics means, what we just talked about. And then there's also <laughs> and then there's also other needs um, for an ethical system, I would say. Um, it needs to um, it needs to be more than um, a legal system. We need to be talking about something that's more than law and more than just rights. My rights to this, your rights to that. Uh, and combating rights. Um, it needs to include the possibility, um, secondly, of um, uh, we would say sins of omission, what this really means is a sort of direction, uh, the possibility, space for higher aspiration, for growth, ethically. Third, it needs to include and engage our emotions, our whole, the whole range of our emotional uh, life and our heart capacity. And that needs to be very much a part of uh, what uh, we bring to ethics and what ethics actually involves for us. But it needs to be also more than that. More than just uh, our emotions or just governed by emotions. More than just involving our emotions as, as instrument and guide. And... Uh, we also said that another need is that there needs to be, we need to be talking about, or thinking about and practicing ethics in a way that a love of ethics uh, and even eros for ethics or for um, uh, values and virtues um, uh, and living ethically comes, comes, is allowed to come in, is given space and is honoured. It's not just uh, natural for it to be there, but it's actually uh, necessary, intrinsic. Sorry, intrinsic and necessary. And then we also talked about dimensionality, and that's mostly what I want to start talking about today when I get to it. Um, it, it, we, We need some kind of rooting in some kind of other dimension, some kind of uh, sense of dimensionality to the whole uh, notion of um, ethics. Ethics needs rooting in some other dimensions. And all this um, needs a kind of ontologies and epistemologies that ground it and that make sense of it. And if we're Buddhist, that means our ontology needs uh, to be more than just saying everything's empty. And lastly, that all this, again, Another need is um, that it's related to the sense of what a human being is and what a human being can be. Okay, so all those, depending on how we count, seven or eight needs. And I said they're not 
we can't go through them in a linear order, at least I can't see a way of going through them in a linear order. And they're not really separate, so they involve and imply each other, these different needs. Um, for example, you know, we talked about emotions the other day, and uh, I talked about the example of a grief ritual. And there's a kind of a grief ritual conceived as and functioning as effectively a space where people can really let their grief rip, where they can uh, cry or even uh, you know feel, feel very deeply, feel emotions deeply and not be shamed for that, maybe even be held for that. Um, there's that kind of grief ritual so conceived, so functioning. And there's another kind of grief ritual, which is more to contextualize um, the grief. And part of the way it puts the grief into context is by um, connecting levels. And that would be exactly um, connecting levels, for example, of human being and, uh, you know, more, what do we call it, soulful being or spiritual being, connecting levels in the cosmos, etc., between matter and whatever, whatever we're going to say, matter and soul, whatever. But... Other, other rituals function to connect levels and then even to uh, transform levels. And, par- and partly what they do then is they, they contextualize. And such a grief ritual um, will actually, is conceived and probably won't function in the same way as the first kind of, kind of grief ritual. It, will, it won't give rise to uh, such a great amount of emotion, etc., and tears. But it's still extremely important, extremely important, I would say. So they're both important. There's something about the second one that's that's easily overlooked. So emotions are not always the most important thing. And again, in the absence of a place for, uh, for dimensionality, because that's what the second kind of ritual does, is it connects dimensions. Or it gives dimensionality, and that's part of the contextualizing of of grief, or uh, or, or contextualizing of matter, or contextualizing of life, or contextualizing of death, or whatever it is. But in the absence uh, of a, a place for dimensionality, then our conceptual framework, again, implicit or explicit, whether it's conscious and explicitly spelled out or implicit it can become uh, limited and limiting, even when we're very well intended. You know, I just really need to, we really need to feel our emotions about species loss or whatever it is. Species extermination. It's very well intended, but there's something I'm not understanding. Mm. There's more to this than my emotion of grief. No matter how deep uh, and bottomless the grief can feel. Actually, the bottomlessness of the grief may be an, a clue that uh, another dimension is needed. And until that other dimension is um, conceived and sensed, even if both the conception and the sense are vague, until then, that grief will be literally bottomless because it's not contacting another dimension. So that would be an example, the, how these different needs are not separate. The question of emotionality and the place of emotions is very connected to the place of the need for dimensionality, etc. We could give a million, a million different examples here, but they're, uh, they're really not separate. So there's no, I don't think there's a linear way through this. And when we come to, okay, thinking about how could we approach ethics through sensing the soul, through soul-making dharma and practice... First of all, a reminder regarding regarding the, the soul making dharma approach. A reminder that this was all arrived at, or is being arrived at, um, through what we call a phenomenological approach. In other words, through our experience. Through, I mean, for some of us, it was arrived at through just the experience of appearances, of experiences, of perceptions, the whole. Uh, uh, fabric ways of looking 
and fabrication notion, which is what I call the phenomenological approach, as far as it uh, relates to emptiness. I'm just staying with that phenomenological approach all the way to the unfabricated, past the unfabricated, and then it opening out and legitimizing the possibility of imaginal practice. So for some, the whole thing is just based on one phenomenological approach, uh, or rather a thread that just evolves. Or the phenomenological approach in the sense based on experience of having images and then paying attention to, hmm, these images uh, sometimes feel a certain way or I notice certain things about them and that's what we'll begin to call, that that's what makes them imaginal. The 28 uh, elements, etc. That's, uh, and, and other, other things, not included in the, in the list of the 28. So I'm just going phenomenologically, I'm just going from my experience including the experience of this is important. There's something about images when they come like this, when they're imaginal, that's important. So all this, uh, just as a reminder, was arrived at by through phenomenological approaches together with a kind of just um, bold and vigorous uh, questioning of typical assumptions that we have in our culture, or that we uh, have in our subcultures, dharma or otherwise. Typical logoi. So it was really just arrived at by, through phenomenology, meaning through our experience, and through, um, and, and through questioning certain inherited sort of indoctrinations. It was not arrived at through some kind of abstract metaphysical speculation. So I, th I think it's important not to lose sight of that in this day and age, where abstract metaphysical speculation has such a has for hundreds of years now such a bad press. When we come to uh, when we come to thinking about okay, soul making dharma approach to ethics, and we said well, basically, there's, there's you could say broadly speaking, there's we could divide that in two. There's one is through working with the imaginal figure. And the other is through the sense of values or virtues um, becoming imaginal ideas, the ideational imaginal. And so two, two broad ways. And just very, very briefly um, to say, well, okay, what does that mean in practice? Um, so, for example, what does that mean in practice with regard to ethics? How would I, how would I um, uh, bring su such a teaching and approach, such teachings and approaches to bear on ethics. So, excuse me, very, very sketchily, let's say, either I feel drawn to do, or X, whatever it is, to express something, to write something, to do something, to, to refuse to do something, whatever it is, whatever X is. I feel drawn to do that, um, though I can see some ethical reasons why I shouldn't do that. Um, okay. So here's my ethical dilemma. Is there an image, an imaginal image, uh, related to doing X? Related to doing X. And again, it might be the very crucible of the not knowing and the heat of the situation, the pressure of the situation that I feel in the soul that gives uh, birth, uh, that in the, in the alchemy um, of the heat of, and the pressure in the crucible, it gives birth to an image, gives rise to an image. But is there an image related to doing X? It might be of doing it, but it's related to doing X. Is it... Uh, soul-making an image? Is it what we call the authentic imaginal? Is it genuine imaginal? Are all the elements there? Are all the elements there? You have to be so careful with this. So careful. So is there a sense of duty in relation to that image? And what's the sense of the, the refraction of the duty? Am I taking it literally? Am I taking it concretely? Is there autonomy of self? Do I have a choice here? Is there humility? Is there fullness of intention? These are really, I'm just selecting some of the really, really uh, obviously important elements here. Is there fullness of intention here? Why do I want to do X? Is there the fullness of intention? Okay, 
So that's really a question. I have to explore it imaginally. Is there an image? And is that really a truly imaginal image with all the elements there? And even then, that's not quite enough. What's the refraction, etc.? And then maybe one thinks about not doing X, whatever X is, and, and maybe there is an image related to that. Or maybe actually there isn't an image, and that's partly why it's not one feels not so cool that way. One can still see that ethically one could make a point of it, that's still important to not do X. So maybe there's a sense of values there. So if there's not um, an image, it's like, oh, what are the values uh, that are related to not doing X? Not doing X um, expresses or upholds certain ethical values. And can I sense into those values with soul? Can I uh, relate to those imaginal ideas, those values, those virtues, um, with with soul? So even though doing X might be actually an imaginal figure, um, not doing X may be an imaginal figure, may be just... um, uh, a sense of the ideational imaginal. But I have to really, really, you know, again, work the practice with all the sophistication, all the care, and all the subtlety of uh, attention and, and all that attunement. And then compare the, the soulfulness, compare the sense of soul making either way, and use that as a guide to ethical choice. Or, it might be that here's an ethical choice that I, I'm, I'm needing to make. Here, here's, here's some situation in my life. And I can see values both, both, side, both sides in either branch of this forking of the road. Choose this, there's values. Choose that, there's values. There is what Hartman would call an antinomy. There's a moral antinomy there. Exactly that. Actually, it might, it might, it might actually be a question of hier- hierarchical difference. Either way, actually, it doesn't matter. Um, can I um, sense with soul into each uh, value and each choice, the, I, the, the imaginal idea, the, the ideational image of each value and each choice, and do that very carefully? I see, I sense the values on both sides. It's either an antim- antinomy or maybe a hi- hierarchy hierarchical choice, but I, I sense uh, what Hartman would call uh, antinomy versus a hierarchy. Or a hierarchy. But um, I'm sensing each each of these um, imaginal ideas, these values, each choice, I'm sensing it with soul as carefully as I can. Again, then I'm comparing the soulfulness. Soulfulnesses on each side. So very, very briefly, that would be um, a, a, a way to proceed very sketchily. That's the kind of thing we're talking about as a basic idea. The kinds of thing we're talking about as a basic idea. But let's let's stay with the. Um, if we think about sensing the soul, as I said, we can divide it up uh, as an approach broadly into working with. Well, if we think about sensing the soul approach to ethics, we can divide it up broadly into uh, an approach with an imaginal figure, an approach with an um, imaginal idea, virtues or values. So, if we talk about the first, let's just not go too fast, let's spend a little time with the first of those, working with an imaginal figure. An imaginal figure has an ethos. It has an ethos, and it has an uh, an ethical perspective. Okay, that's partly why values is one of the twenty-eight elements of the imaginal. An imaginal figure has an ethos and it has an ethical perspective. This figure, that monster, that snake, whatever it is, that flower, that tree. So there's another possibility for practice here that I would like to suggest and just again sketch some instructions. So we've talked about, uh, you're familiar by now with the practice of, sometimes we call it tuness, sometimes we call it the balance of attention. I'd like to um, introduce the practice of threeness, okay, and a balance of attention within threeness um, in a situation. So it's really talking about practice now. Here's in a situation, 
I might here I maybe I'm 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 with someone else, or I'm having uh, some kind of dialogue with someone else, or they're saying something to me, or or it's a difficult interaction, whatever, some kind of situation. There's an other, there's myself, and then there's a third, which is an imaginal figure that that uh, has come to me. And it might be an old imaginal figure that I've known for years, or one that's just come very recently, or even in that moment, perhaps. But um, And can I play with the balance of attention, the sort of relative weighting, uh, W-E-I-G-H-T-I-N-G, the relative weighting of my attention between the three? So what is it? I'm here with this other person in this situation, or here with this situation. 10% of my attention, let's say, with the imaginal figure, and the other divided between self and myself and the other, myself as as regular human being. Or divide three ways equally, 33% each. Or 50% with the imaginal figure, or whatever. So it's similar to the two-ness balance of attention exercise, but it's now it's three-ness. And the question is, what then happens to my sense of the situation? What then happens to my sense of the situation with this other person um, or, or some other situation? So one could do it in... In uh, real time, in other words, this is going on now. I'm putting myself in a situation and trying this. Uh, so I think I gave an example several times over the over recent years of just that image of, uh, that I have of, of me as a jazz musician. It's actually kind of it's it's real life. It's memory. I was a jazz musician, but it's become image for me in 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 all kinds of ways and very rich ways and sometimes difficult ways. And sometimes just very beautiful ways. But sometimes, I think I shared a couple of times, that, you know, sometimes that might come in, that image of jazz musician, um, just a li- tiny little bit um, in the very background, let's say in an interview, in a Dharma interview. And it's just very much there in the background, but it's uh, affecting my whole sense of the situation and how I respond and uh, the whole dance of the interaction. It's very, very subtle. Um, So that would be an example. But one could do... So that's using it in the now, because one could do this. In other words, here's a a present situation, and one's using an image. Okay, it's it's a past image. One's resurrecting it deliberately, deliberately calling it to life in the moment, and then just having it be in the background, or more in the foreground, or whatever it is, for a situation that's happening now. One can also do this with a, with a, with a memory of a situation, a memory perhaps of a difficult situation or a confusing situation or one that just we ended up feeling very contracted from or we ended up judging ourselves or um, whatever it is. So that's one thing, is just um, bringing the image uh, in, into the situation, if you like, then playing with the balance of attention, seeing how does it uh, affect the sense of the situation playing with the balance of attention three ways, and how do the relative balances affect the sense of the situation? Whether it's the memory of a situation or a situation in the present life. Then there's also the possibility here, can I sense into the imaginal figure's perspective, um, their feelings, their evaluation of things? So it might be, the imaginal figure's evaluation of me, the imaginal figure's evaluation of my stuff, or even uh, my old stuff, the place where I trip up, the place where I get caught again, how do they see it? What's their perspective on it? On my stuff, my difficulties, my mistakes. I feel like, if I'm doing it from memory, I feel like I did make a mistake there. Can I get a sense of the imaginal figure's perspectives, feelings, and evaluations on me, my stuff, my difficulties, my blocks, my mistakes, etc.? Can I get a sense of the imaginal perspectives, feeling, uh, and and perspectives of the other? Can I get a sense of the imaginal figure's perspectives and feelings and evaluation of the whole situation? 
whether it's an obviously ethical situation or not. So I think I think there's a lot of potential here. Can I enter into the imaginal figure, inhabit it, see through its eyes, sense through its senses, feel through its heart? Okay, it might be a stage further, really immersing there into that. So this is more than uh, you know seeing an image and, and seeing what it does in, in imaginal meditation. And it's also more than just an image of sense of me. Okay, so there's a lot of possibilities here. But an image imaginal figure has an ethos and an ethical perspective. Sometimes what happens is we get blinkered or caught or blinded. Um, ethically. And sometimes an imaginal figure, because values is, is one of the elements of the imaginal, uh, can shine a different light um, on uh, a situation, an ethical situation, on ourselves, on an interaction, on our difficulties, on our mistakes, on all kinds of things. Okay, so again, very, very brief sketch of, an, of another kind of practice, but I think very, very, um, certainly soul making. Uh, potentially, but also helpful in all kinds of ways. One of the ways I'm thinking about is with regard to shame. Because there might be, um, either in a situation, or after a situation, we feel inadequate, or our shame, our kind of habitual sense of shame, locks in, etc. And so, doing this kind of practice, excuse me again, either now, live, or or in memory, can uh, really open things up and actually begin to separate out what we might call a shallow kind of shame. There's nothing but dukkha there. It's not necessary. It's not serving any function other than creating dukkha and a binding for ourselves. I don't like this word ego, but let's, uh, I really don't like it. Ego, shallow shame. Separating that out from what we might call a kind of soul shame, or soul level shame. Which may be more authentic, may have more necessity, may be, will be, more fruitful. So was there a talk I think I gave on the path of the imaginal retreat? I think it was called something like the love and the demands of the imaginal, or something like that but deliberately in the title putting this kind of uh, what can seem like they don't go together, the love and the demands of the imaginal. Opening up that whole, the whole notion of duty to image, duty to soul. So there's so much here that's uh, potentially important, potentially healing, and healing at different levels, and just in terms of uh, dissolving or blowing away the kind of shallow shame, but also opening up to maybe a level of shame that is actually in itself healing, something we don't tend to think of, a healthy shame, a healing shame that connects us more with our soul power and soulfulness and sense of duty and meaningfulness and redeems something, reconnects, again, recontextualizes something or contextualizes it. So I think a lot of possibilities here. Let's linger again. Let's not go too fast. Um, I do want to talk about dimensionality primarily. But I just want to linger a little bit on this whole question of, of shame and guilt. So uh, just very loosely, I would say shame has to do with, at least the way I would define it, is, um, a negative view of how I am. I am bad, or I am worthless, or wh- whatever it is. I am. It's a it's a a painful um, uh, belief and binding belief about how I am. Guilt is is a view or views about what I did or what I neglected to do. And it's quite possible, of course. I mean, there's a connection here because it's quite possible that if um, if I'm not careful with um, 
with a guilt I feel in relation to what I did and didn't do that I felt I should or shouldn't have done, shouldn't or should have done, um, it's possible that that guilt starts kind of um, uh, congealing, mortifying, uh, well, congealing and kind of, um, yeah, actually like a kind of rigor mortis, into a sense of shame. It becomes something more pervasive, a uh, conclusion that I then carry around or walk around in about who I am. It's quite possible that the guilt, if we don't, if we're not careful with it, um, can 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 lead to, to a more pervasive and long-lasting shame about who I am. Of course, it's also possible the other way around. To the degree that I have a shame and I carry around or I walk around in a shame about who I am, um, it's more likely that I will perceive situations and conclude, without much thought at all, that I am guilty of doing this wrong or neglecting to do that which would have been better. So these are loaded subjects in our in our culture, shame and guilt. And you know, a lot of us inherit, of course, part of our uh, inheritance around ethics and morals is, is quite a painful uh, relationship with these ideas of shame and guilt coming, um, some would say, through uh, through certain Christian teachings or interpretations of, um, you know, different teachings, different Christian teachings of original sin or whatever it is. Of course, that, that's not the case with all people. It doesn't have to be the case for Christian teachings, but I think a lot of people do feel that way, and so the whole area of shame and guilt is something one just one just can't go near those those terms or those experiences as human beings in any way that's helpful uh, at all, other than trying to dissolve them or dismiss them. And then a lot of people come to Buddha Dharma because it seems that Buddha Dharma doesn't talk in terms of original sin and guilt and that sort of thing. Uh, and in, indeed, a lot of the way it is taught now in the West is, is very free of such terms and such even suggestions as, as shame and guilt and all that. But the Buddha um, did, in fact, talk about uh, these kinds of things. And he talked in, uh, about hiri and otapa. Uh, two Pali words, hiri, H-I-R-I, and otapa, O-T-T-A-P-P-A. And he called them the guardians of the world. Hiri and Ottawa, the guardians of the world. And he said, when these qualities wane, and Hiri and Ottawa wane, human society moves towards the animal realm. Humans become more like animals, and the human society becomes more like the, like the animal realm. What's he talking about? Hiri is uh, something, we could say more, I don't know if it's internally directed is the right word, but it's, it's uh, really the innate sense of shame over a moral transgression. So we really feel ashamed for doing something wrong. And it's connected with our own self-respect. Um, it, it's related to a, a sense of our, our personal sort of honour. Okay. Uh, this is in the Itiwutaka, for those of you who are interested. Um among other places, I think. Um, and then Otapa is uh, kind of more, slightly more externally oriented. I don't think that's such a satisfying division. But anyway, it's the kind of um, moral dread, sometimes it's translated as, or, or fear of the results of moral, moral wrongdoing. So here is this innate sense of shame over a moral transgression. Otapa is a moral dread or fear of the results of wrongdoing, which includes... Um, fear of the blame and punishment by others. So that one's actually, that's included. And the Buddha says these are really important qualities. We need to be afraid of being blamed and punished by others in our uh, community, in our society. It's also a fear of the karmic consequences of wrongdoing. And it's a fear that by wrongdoing I will uh, scuffer my chances of uh, attaining Nibbāna. Buddha Gosa uh, talks about, uh, gives an analogy. Um, uh, so it's like having an iron rod, and Hiri is uh, the shit 
that uh, is smeared on one end of the, of the rod. So you wouldn't want to pick up the rod there. But otapa is uh, as if the other end of the rod has been placed in a fire and it's red hot and you wouldn't want to pick up the rod there. So there'd be hiri, there'd be a kind of disgust, shame or disgust, um, to pick up uh, the the rod at the at the end with the shit on it. And there's the otapa, the kind of fear of picking up at the burning end, the red hot end, and, and completely burning your hand there. So... Shame or disgust and moral dread or fear of result, uh, fear of the results of moral wrongdoing. And the Buddha says, whatever evil arises, whatever evil arises, it springs from a lack of hiri and otapa. And then he also says, all virtuous deeds spring from the sense of hiri and otapa. Which I find... Uh, a little problematic and limiting because it leaves, again, no room for eros. All virtuous deeds spring from a sense of shame or a sense of fear. Where's the room for eros there? So interesting. But anyway, these are there in Buddha's teachings, um, and you can hear just how much the Buddha uh, emphasized them and, and, and how strong he was in his articulation of their importance. But it's interesting also, you know, because nowadays in postmodern society, we, we postmodern understanding, let's say, or inquiry, we, we put a lot of emphasis on the, uh, you know, recognizing whether, is, whether something is socially or uh, communally constructed and contingent. And it sounds, uh, to a large degree, like some of what the Buddha's talking about in here in Ottapa is. So that's a whole other question, whether that's necessarily bad or debars it, um, or what it means for its reality, status, etc. I'm not going to go into that now. But going back to the Sila and Soul talks, you know, we talked about following Hartman, Hartman the, the, uh, the idea that there is a place, and there should be a place for healthy shame and healthy guilt, is what Hartman mostly talks about, healthy guilt. And uh, I, I wonder, too, whether there's a way of r- redeeming this whole area in terms of our ethical um, practice and our ethical sensibility and our approach to ethics. You know, after the Nuremberg uh, trials, trying Nazi war criminals, they were named and shamed. And then, and then executed, in fact, but some of them, but um, they were named and shamed. Nowadays there's, a, there's this sort of teaching about don't, don't name and shame. Um, but they were named and shamed. And it, you know, it may have to do with just what is deemed in the society at the time as outrageous enough to warrant naming and shaming. So there's, there's, you know, maybe a place, and there is a place, as I've written about and talked about, that there is a place for um, certainly ending uh, or dissolving feelings of guilt, thinking more about um, actions and the conditions that gave rise to actions rather than persons, etc. There is the importance of that. But maybe there's also the place for taking responsibility for a healthy sense of guilt, uh, etc. So I was reading, I actually wasn't reading, I saw a couple of headlines in the newspaper recently about, um, I think it was just in in Dutch culture, in Holland, that it's becoming, uh, I think it was in Holland, that um, flight shaming has is becoming more and more okay, that it's more and more okay to... Um, suggest to someone that they're flying too much and unnecessarily, and the ethical cost of that. Well, why why should that not be okay? Or or shaming someone for driving SUVs now? SUVs use so much more petrol now that they used to be mostly diesel. I think now they're the petrol cars, but they're um, not diesel in other words. But they they use so much more, and they emit so much more carbon. 
and they take so much more, uh, they emit so much more carbon in their manufacture, etc., etc. And they're the fastest growing uh, strand or whatever stream of the automotive industry. So much so that um, the automotive industry is, is not at all reducing its overall emissions, it's actually increasing them because of the increasing amounts of SUVs sold. I don't know. Well, maybe there's a place for um, shaming. Maybe it's a necessary thing. Maybe, I don't know. But, you know, in terms of flight shaming, you know, I didn't read the articles, but um, I do remember, you know, I was first teaching and around different groups of senior teachers, and sometimes I would hear them talking about just, you know, because they were flying all over to teach retreats and, and about their sort of, what's it called, frequent flyer status. And sometimes when people can talk about this, it almost just sounds like almost a subtle a subtle boasting in there. Or uh, identification with uh, being important because one flies a lot. And maybe, you know, the culture will, uh, and society will uh, hopefully not, not in not too long a time evolve to a point where that kind of subtle boasting or identification as being important will be, will be, you know, about as okay as kind of subtly boasting how many slaves one owns. And it's easy to I've talked about this, so I'm not going to go into this. Just like it's easy. To, oh, but I'm, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm flying for the for the Dharma. So it's I'm con I'm. Because I'm teaching Dharma, it's less suffering. I'm cre- I'm contributing to less suffering. Like the slave owner would say, "Well, I'm helping the economy, aren't I?" Sometimes this whole idea of what it's okay to shame and what it isn't is uh, really, again, socially uh, deemed based on um, where the where the kind of you know average or lowest bar of um, ethical views of right and wrong have reached in a society at any time. Anyway, it might be <clears throat> that, uh, certainly with regard to uh, the ideational imaginal, imaginal ideas of, of values and virtues, um, there can be, as Hartman said, there can be a sense of guilt and and he and he said we went into this in Sila and so there needs to be a sense of guilt. There needs to be place for that. And as something that's inevitable in uh, ethical life and practice. So maybe that um, I don't know. It, also with regard to imaginal figures, it may be uh, you know reverence is one of the elements of imag- of the imaginal. And when I was trying to find the right term, I remember looking up the word reverence, and it's related, I think, to, uh, from the Latin, to the capacity to, to, to feel fear and awe in relationship to something. So maybe this is also, uh, you know, there's a place for, um, wrapped up in the reverence, there's a place for something like Hiri and Ottawa in relation, whether it's, um, imaginal ideas we're talking about, values and virtues, or an imaginal figure, and how we are or are not refracting that figure. Or there's a possible um, shame or guilt, a hiri, otapa, for not trying to approach uh, something, a situation, a choice, an ethical choice, and not having tried to approach it um, uh, with sensing the soul. And then feeling... Uh, a hiri or otapa, some kind of shame or guilt for that, but a healthy one. One that takes us forward, and, uh, decide to, to and aspire to do something differently in, in, in when the following situation comes, or the next situation comes. But remember, all this, when we're talking about um, soul-making, the imaginal, all this is in the context of the benevolence of an image, love and loving, love and sorry, love and being loved, being loved, that's an element of the imaginal. 
And I would say also, when you really get into the practice of the ideational imaginal, the ideas also can love you. They will love you. They do love you. So the ideational imaginal, there's a sense of the benevolence. We are in relationship with um, beings, figures, imaginal ideas that love us and place demands on us. Love and demands of the imaginal. Love and demands of imaginal ideas. And that word benevolence, um, again from, from Latin, bene, vol, uh, vol is related to our will, it's wanting, bene, good, what's good. Want They want what's good for us. They want, there's a beneficence, they want, um, they want what's good for us, benevolent, that's what it actually means. Someone asked me a little while ago to, what do I mean by this element, dimensionality, shaving, shading into divinity? Uh, and so partly in trying to, in trying to sort of open it out a bit more with words, sort of think, well, it's pointing to a sense of benevolent mystery. So when I have a sense of an image having this dimensionality shading into divinity, I partly mean there's a sense of benevolent mystery there. Mystery, but also it's benevolent. And one, one, one senses that, even if it's only subtly and vaguely. Um, dimensionality is, to me, related to the word depth. And depth and one way of understanding what the word depth means is, is something something's deep if it's not immediately apparent or immediately obvious. So that's the mystery. There's a benevolent mystery. That's part of what mystery means. Depth. Not immediately obvious. Uh, something is not immediately obvious. It's also, it's, it's kind of hidden from immediate, immediate obvious view. But the hiddenness there uh, that's part of this dimensionality shading into divinity, is not menacing. It's not like something I can't make out and it's kind of sinister or menacing, or the fact that I can't sense what it is clearly is uh, kind of ominous in some way. So that's... Uh, this, is, this benevolence is very much part of what we mean by dim- dimensionality shading into divinity. It also means is related to having soft and elastic edges, which is another of the elements. The dimensionality and the divinity is not um, sharply defined, clearly uh, delineated. So, dimensionality, I said that's that's what I wanted to begin talking about today. Um, and I said in the last talk, you know, ethics needs, it needs something, uh, or the, in order to ground ethics, in order to make sense of ethics, in order to uh, evaluate between different ethical choices, in order for the whole thing to kind of really function with any power, in our lives, and any vitality in our lives, something needs to be sensed or granted um, as uh, having a higher or deeper dimension or order or level. And in that higher, deeper dimension or order, that's kind of naturally where, uh, because of this, a, a deeper dimension, higher dimension, naturally meaningfulness, value, purpose, sanctity, in the broadest range of that term, uh, they naturally reside there. And without that, without a sense of giving, granting or sensing dimensionality in, in, in something, uh, ethics cannot really work. Or it really doesn't work very well. So I think I said, I can't remember where it was, but, um, you know, scientific, scientific materialism, in other words, a kind of um, way of thinking and enterprise that wants to, tries to explain everything, all phenomena and all experience, uh, and the whole of the cosmos, inner and outer, um, 
explain it through a reduction to just purely, uh, let's say, material, uh, small material elements. As a scientistic, that means that the it, trying to explain everything that way, and the materialism, scientific materialism, is reductions into little, little bits and bobs of billiard balls. Scientific, scientific materialism as a kind of approach to or enterprise to explain the whole of, of existence and all our experience, it, it implies that there isn't a reality to values. There's not a, uh, you know, they're not grounded in anything. That's there's no there's no possibility possibility of grounding values in anything real. And actually, as I explained, whenever it was. <clears throat> whichever talk or series it was, it actually becomes very um, hard in that in such a enterprise, a scientific, scientific materialism, to even even to try and justify um, why we should try and reduce suffering in the world, because suffering itself is also um, uh, scientifically and materialistically reduced. It's just the movement of particles in the universe. It's just What's suffering? Well, it's really a material thing. It's some um, neurological impulses. That's really what suffering is, because that's really what everything is. And neurological impulses are, can be reduced to neurotransmitters and molecules across ne- neurological synapses, all of which down to molecules, down to um, subatomic particles. And really, suffering is just a, a shifting, a moving around of of particles in the universe. It has no more or less worth than anything else. So even the trying to justify why we should reduce suffering and, and trying to make that as a basis of ethics can have no grounding if there's no dimensionality. Everything's equal. It's just matter in this way. Everything. Also, the scientific method rules out um, or is the used to for a long time, it rules out human feeling um, regarding anything. Remember, we try, in the scientific method, put my feelings, my affects, my desires and wishes, put that all aside. I just, that's second class citizen. It's not, uh, it's a distorting thing, etc. Put that aside. Um, so my feelings about anything, including my feelings about values and what's valuable and what's deeply valuable, um, scientific method sidelines it. Or scientific method um, studies feelings and may even measure them more recently these days. Um, but it still can have, it still can offer no real grounding or basis for them. So I might. You know, as a psychologist, behavioral psychologist, no, not behavioral psychologist, but some other kind of psychologist, decide to study f- human feelings and maybe I measure them, whether that's, um, you know, in brainwave activity or from questionnaires or whatever it is. But I still can give no real grounding or basis for them. So scientific materialism becomes. Uh, it becomes impossible from that basis to root any ontology of ethics. And this, there's, there's nothing real to give any um, rooting for ethics, or any. And there's no recourse to um, something of value. to explain why we should do this and why we shouldn't do that ethically. Um, I should point out, just while we're on this subject about reductionism and dimensionality, um, so a kind of scientific reductionism that's kind of as a reductionism down to, for example, billiard ball-like particles, everything goes down to that, or whatever goes down to that, is is a kind of reduction um, merely to smaller units of the same kind of stuff. And so it's a flattening reductionism. 
And certainly if I start with something that feels rich, uh, like my sense of value, and I reduce it down to uh, billiard ball-like particles, it's taking something that was um, dimensional, and uh, rich, etc., and reducing it to something that's very uh, flat. It's a flattening reductionism. If I'm just talking about matter, and I reduce matter, this table, and I reduce the table down to billiard ball-like particles in my theory of it, then uh, that's uh, also a flattening redu reductionism. Or rather, it's, it's, a, it's a reductionism that doesn't introduce another dimension. It's, it's uh, well, yeah, it's kind of flat. If, however, uh, my scientific reduction goes down um, past such basic p particles, down to the sort of quantum mathematical probability functions that I've talked about, um, which exist as these sort of complex... Abs uh, complex mathematical functions related uh, to probability, but they exist, these uh, uh, equations or functions or geometries, they exist in a kind of multi-dimensional abstract mathematical space. So I've gone past electrons. So what's an electron? Well, actually, an electron is this. Um, we can't point to a particle or a wave, or all we can point to is this kind of abstract, multidimensional, mathematical, I'm talking about mathematically multidimensional space, um, uh, entity. It's not even matter anymore. We've reduced to something then of a different kind, a different order. Then we have given a kind of dimensionality. It's not a flattening, but we've, but we've actually dimensionalized matter. We've gone from something that it seems like to something uh, something that it seems obvious it's, 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 even if it's just small uh, bits of solidity it's gone to something that we can't even really uh, say it's the same kind or order of stuff there's a different dimension there so it's also reduction but it's, it's, got, a, it's, got, a dim, it's got a dimensionalizing in it still that second kind of reduction that is dimensionalizing, say it's going down to these very abstract, say what's really real, not the table, not even the electron or the proton, what's really real is these abstract, very complex, very sophisticated um, mathematical entities, mathematical functions, equations, that exist in a, in a, in a strange, abstract, mathematically multidimensional space. That's what's real. Okay, that it gives a kind of dimensionalizing, but it would still be problematic if that view attempts to explain, put that in quotes, things like human love and the sense of meaning through that reduction. In other words, again, if it's scientific, if it attempts a reduction of the totality of existence, of being, etc. Still not flattening, but it would be very problematic. It's not capable of doing so. It's not capable of making sense that way. Okay, so dimensionality is what... I'm going to look at, start looking at dimensionality. We just touched on it already briefly. So... Um, it's a complicated subject and difficult to even find the right language to talk about it, but um, one way that a sense of dimensionality has historically kind of been ripped out of a question of, uh, of our, our exploration of ethics is... Um, we can trace it historically in one one way, and one of its roots actually was in the uh, came from the Pro Protestant Reformation. Excuse me. One way that was that, that came from that seed, um, from that revolution, really uh, ended up impoverishing uh, the di uh, kinds of dimensionality that human beings could. Um, 
feel and conceive of and sense in existence in relation to all kinds of things and also in time in relation to ethics. Came through the Protestant Reformation partly because one of the main things the Protestant Reformation set out to do was to abolish and reject any kind of mediation between a human being and God. So this was one of its central sort of uh, attempts and thrusts and insistencies to reject anything that was intermediate between the human being and God. So no priests, no priests with any kind of higher function uh, or who've served as intermediaries in any way. No sacraments either. No uh, this holy ritual or this holy or made holy um, uh, object, this sanctified object, whatever it is, um, can mediate, is necessary to mediate between a human being and God. There was this um, attempt at completely getting getting uh, rid of any intermediaries, priests, sacraments, etc. And what, what that brought with it was also a kind of affirmation or elevation or emphasis on ordinary life. So it wasn't just the life in the church. It wasn't just the Eucharist. Uh, so it wasn't just the life in the church. It was certainly not the, the Eucharist or the Mass or, or the priest who, who uh, was needed as an intermediary. They also, not quite the same point, but they also um, uh, a kind of rejected monasticism, monks and nuns, for a slightly different reason. It was probably connected, but one reason so the was given was just basically it's, there's nothing between you and God and it's totally up to you uh, and God, that relationship and um, all of us need to have total commitment, there's no such thing as a um, person having more or less commitment, you either have a full commitment or you're damned um, and, and a monastic being regarded as someone who's decided Yes, I do want to give everything to God. I do want to focus wholeheartedly on that. That is the highest thing, and I, I, my commitment is is total. To in the Protestant Reformation, the view was that's um, that's just uh, not a, not a healthy notion because all of us need to have a total commitment. So no monastics. But. I mean, you might sort of say, in a, in, a, in a way, that's silly, isn't it? It doesn't really bear out, just looking around us at humans. Clearly, there are people with very different levels of motivation and commitment. Even if we just talk about to, to their music or art or, or poetry or whatever it is, or whatever. And we see it definitely as well in the, in the world of Dharma and practice. There's people with very different motivations and also different... Um, Levels of talent, you know. So there's something a little bit silly with that. But anyway, that's a side point. There's this principal thing I want to want to focus on now is this rejection of mediation, rejection of priests of sacraments, but also uh, a rejection of angels as intermediaries. Okay, so all this came with the Protestant Reformation: rejection of angels and saints. And. Virgin Mary, anything that was an intermediary or could be uh, seen or regarded as an intermediary between the human being and God. There's a rejection of angels and including, therefore, the role of angels as uh, reflecting and refracting at different levels the totally inconceivable nature or being of God. So we reject intermediaries, then angels get reject, rejected, and uh, their role of reflecting and refracting at different levels, the, this totally inconceivable nature of God, that gets rejected as well. Also is rejected as angels, as beings, the human, the human can in turn refract and mirror that we can 
So we talk about refracting the angel, uh, reflecting, refracting the daemon, mirroring in our life the image. So that gets rejected, thrown out as well. So rejecting angels as beings the human can, uh, rejecting angels as beings that reflect and refract at different levels, you know, the totally uh, inconceivable nature of God, the transcendent, almost unknowable being in itself of God. And also a rejection of angels as beings that the human can in turn refract, reflect, mirror, and be called by. And in being called by, come into more intimate relationship with and sense of the attributes of the divine. And in refracting and mirroring the angels, express and manifest in human life the attributes of the divine. So all this has to do with a kind of hierarchy of being, a hierarchy of cosmic being. God hierarchy of angels, human being, etc. Nature. So, we can talk about, I've touched on it before, but these platonic ideas and forms they're sometimes called. And they came to be regarded as the attributes of God. And we can think of them as, as I said in, I think it was a Sealer and Soul Talks, the ideational, imaginal, they're related to these platonic notions of ideas and forms and images. Attributes of God and angels. So ideas, forms, ideational, imaginal, and, Im- and images all can be seen and regarded as the attributes of God and, and angels. So the same thing. So there's a dimensionality here that was scrapped, was done away with, was outlawed, in fact. A hierarchy of intermediaries. And that whole dimensionality that opened up with that, that was very much related to what was ultimately good. That pointed and drew us towards what was good, that uh, enabled us to... uh, refract and be drawn towards what was virtuous, etc. Embodied virtue. Connected virtue with the divine and that ultimate dimensionality that way. Connected virtue with holiness with that whole scale. When we um, talk about images in soul making dharma and we talk about the ideational uh, imaginal or ideational images we can say that um, they are a dimension as angels are in this sen- in this old sense pre reformation they are a dimension and we feel that uh, we're refracting reflecting something of, of a different level. We can also say, and we do say, they, they have dimensionality. So experientially it's as if the sense of an image is as if in itself it has a dimensionality shading into divinity. So they are a dimension. Their very existence tells us of, of, a, of a dimensionality. But they have in themselves, so to speak, or in our sense of them, they have their being has a kind of dimensionality shading into divinity. So they are and they have dimensionality. And in soul making, Dharma, you know, when we, um, again, this dimensionality, it's 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 a connection. Okay, it's it, and and this whole. Uh, order of angels and angels as intermediaries is, is really something that connects. It's a, sometimes called a chain of being, although that phrase became mixed up and two very different ideas got mixed up in what that meant. Um, but it 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 connects with 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 one thread these different levels of being, different dimensions. So that if I pray. 
to the angels in a, in a supplicatory way, if I ask for help from the angels. And sometimes I do, sometimes I have a sense of the, the soul-making angels, the angels of soul-making, and being um, so ill and so unwell, and sometimes trying to give talks or whatever it is, and feeling in myself not able to I will um, pray to the angels, my sense of the soul-making angel, the image, the imaginal sense of soul-making Dharma angels. And in my sense of that, of these angels, so-called, and the, the supplication to them, they are not me, but they're also not not me. They are not me, but they're not other than me. Or they are other, but there is this direct line uh, from my being, from them to my being, and that somehow includes my being. Or to say it another way, I participate in the angels, and they participate in me. I participate in an image. And this imaginal figure participates in me. So historically, one of the things that happened, as I said, in the Protestant Reformation, one of the seeds there um, ended up having quite a uh, devastating effect on, well, in all kinds of ways, and, and, and a lot of really good things, obviously, as well, but quite devastating effect on how we relate to how we, uh, how legitimate we feel um, is the world of angels, and any sense of intermedi- intermediaries with divinity or a, a sense of dimensionality in all kinds of ways in our existence. So we inherit that partly as also imaginal practitioners. We inherit uh, the history of, of uh, Western theology, in fact, and Western philosophy. And we can't help bumping into or being buffeted by or constrained by um, the you know different elements of that history of Western thought. <clears throat> but again, what happens when when um, when we don't have uh, dimensionality is that it, it affects our sense of ethics. So, um, there's an illustration of one way it affects the sense of uh, the imaginal, um, but also our sense of angels, again, as reflecting, um, as, as refracting the virtues, and the virtues being uh, the ideas, the forms, which are the, the divine attributes of a God who's, of a divinity whose nature is actually completely transcendent and unspeakable and beyond any attributes. But what happens when we, when we rule out uh, dimensionality is, is our, we actually limit what we can do with ethics. So I think, you know, human rights, which is some, something we've become so, so used to as a notion now, I think it was, you know, the roots of, of that notion are in uh, Hobbes and Grotius, I think, and, and some others. Um, so the notion of civil rights, uh, I mean, in, in civic rights, or whatever, and um, the roots of that are in Hobbes and Grotius, but it's not because a human being, or, or actually you know, these kinds of human beings, or this portion of human beings, can see how fraction, fractional it was, uh, partial it was, um, it, it, was, it wasn't that a human being has these rights because, for example, they're made in the divine image, which would be um, calling on uh, the divinity as uh, and the fact of human beings being made in the divine image to give a kind of dimensionality to justify 
um, the sanctity uh, and the careful treating of human beings because they're made in, divi- in the divine image. You understand? So when we say, wh- why should human beings have rights? Because they're made in the divine image. It's, it's giving a dimension as an explanation, as a grounding. Um, so, but the original movement and development of the idea of rights um, in society wasn't uh, wasn't coming from the idea of divine image or that kind of grounding. It was coming again post Reformation um, as a kind of people were trying to figure out a basis for law. So it wasn't even a question of morality and virtue, really. It was trying to ensure stable society, stable societies. And, and it was devised, it came up as an idea, um, you know, in the times of the, the post-Reformation wars. You know, enormous bloodshed and brutality in, um, in Europe at that time. And also the civil war in England, likewise very bloody and traumatic. So how can we have um, uh, a, a sort of basis for law? What we, when we start, people started think, thinking away from kind of purely theological and soul questions and dimensions uh, to ground ethics to more legal ways of thinking about it and, and contractual. What's the social contract? These are all ideas that, that were born then, post-Reformation, um, in attempts at a purely secular moral philosophy. In other words, one that wasn't grounded, um, or was only very little grounded, in, in recourse to the dimensionality of divinity. Just as a complete aside, I don't know if I've mentioned this in, in another talk, I was reading a book called... I think it's called Epistemologies of the South. It's a collection of kind of academic essays by um, sort of post-colonial or anti-colonial thinkers. And uh, one of them was pointing out that the whole notion of human rights was a colonial notion and a Western notion, and they were rejecting it. So it's a very surprising thing to read, because we're so used to think. I'm so used to thinking of that as a kind of, this is you know, really basic and important universal notion. Everyone could sign up to this. And this person was saying, no, that's some, you know, something created by colonial white guys. Um, Anyway, that's an aside. So when there's no uh, dimensionality, then we very easily, it's very easy for ethics, as I said, to slide into um, what really becomes just law, or this kind of trying to figure out, okay, what what are people's rights? And then you get this argument between rights, which is very hard to um, to adjudicate. But it's partly because there's the withdrawing or the ruling out of any other dimensionality. And it has consequences. So something needs to be sensed, um, sensed uh, or sensed as or granted uh, a higher dimensionality, a deeper dimensionality. It needs to be felt to be of a different level or order. And in that other level, somehow naturally reside meaningfulness, value, purpose, sanctity, etc. And without that, uh, we run into a lot of problems um, in our approach to ethics in our trying to figure out ethical philosophies or practices something or other needs to be sensed or granted as being of a higher deeper dimensionality level order whatever we're going to call it and what happens um, this is partly something I read in Charles Taylor recently um he uses very different language and is coming at the thing from a slightly different angle. Um, but what, when in language we're using, when there's no dimensionality, or when the dimensionality is kind of hidden um, or unconscious, or we could also say in the language I've used in the past, when the, the soul preferences, because 
what I give dimensionality to has also to do with what I, uh, where my sense of soul making is. Um, but when the dimensionality or my or my soul and or my soul preferences are hidden or unconscious, unconscious, it brings um, certain consequences to the philosophy. Um, so we've talked about, you know, I talked about in other talks in the past, uh, you know, what happens, uh, or rather, am I choosing a dharma? Am I choosing a notion of awakening and goal and all that? Am I choosing a dharma based on really what my soul is desiring um, as a way of feeling uh, myself and the cosmos? What kind of cosmos do I want to live in? What's my fantasy of self and cosmos? And then building the Dharma around that. And and that not being admitted. That actually I want to see the cosmos this way. And I want to see myself in relation to the cosmos this way. And that's what's uh, that's why I'm choosing this kind of version of the Dharma. So when a dimensionality is um, refused or it's hidden, unconscious. What you get is a kind of, Charles Taylor says in his words, um, parasitic philosophies. Um, and I'm not sure whether he said this for all, or at least some of what he calls enlightenment-derived modern positions. I don't, I don't think it's all of them, but I'm not sure if he actually says that. But um, They're parasitic in that they're, they're actually... <laughs> relying on some already established moral assumptions about right or wrong or about what should be uh, yeah what should be done or not done but they're refusing to give a why uh, they're refusing in other words to give a dimensionality there's no grounding in anything else so they're parasitic on older philosophies that already or older notions all the currents in the society that already established um, these assumptions around ethics. And they just take the same assumptions. They don't change them at all. They just piggyback on them, but they withdraw the why. And they, they actually don't need to provide a why because there's a current of, all, all, uh, of people already, already um, established in, that, in those views of those moral assumptions about right or wrong. But also, and this is Charles Taylor pointing out, they have, they provide no positive view, or you know, no constructive practice. And I, I would, you know, want to agree with this and actually elaborate. There's no positive view or positive framework um, of philosophy or practice, whether it's personal or, let's say, governmental. You can tell when uh, a philosophy is, um, or or even a dharma, or a, or, a, um, or an approach is is uh, parasitic in that way because it's characterized by mostly its polemic attack on other positions. Mostly, what you hear very little positive in the sense of constructing views, constructing practices, constructing philosophies, etc., coherent frameworks, mostly what you would hear and read is polemic attack on some other view. Or if something is constructed, it's very thin soup. Very thin soup. I was giving you an example in some of those uh, online seminars um, about kind of trying to construct... Uh, a, a Buddhist aesthetics just around sort of the Buddhist notion of impermanence and then art always has to point to impermanence whatever kind of art and it's terribly thin you know, as an idea or as a framework or a, it's very, very thin without something being given this you know, granted or sensed with um, uh, a, dimen a dimension a deeper dimension, a higher, deeper dimension, order, level. Actually, it's impossible. It's impossible to ground ethics. It's impossible to make sense of it. It's impossible to even construct uh, and give a why we should do this and not that. So talking in the Sea and Soul talks about Richard Rorty, 
and how if you read his writings carefully, he will say, we cannot ground it. He actually refuses. He's very, there's no such thing as another dimension. There's no higher grounding. There's no, you cannot ground ethics in anything else, etc. Um, but then he, then just it slips out in the language that he uses that he's, he's using notions of what's good or, or bad or uh, etc. But he has no way of explaining or what, justifying why that is because there's no other grounding. And I don't know exactly who Charles Taylor meant, but I, I have a... Somehow in reading, I got a sense that he was referring to... I think they're called the New Atheists. Is there a New Atheism movement, I think? I'm not sure. Um, uh, in terms of just... There's nothing there except polemic attack on other positions. And actually in terms of what's being offered as a coherent construction of... Uh, frameworks, conceptual frameworks, what's being offered in terms of practice, there's either nothing there at all or, or very, very, very thin soup. There's no way forward offered, really. Again, with the soul-making dharma, um, uh, but there's both, the, the, you know, we've tried to really create uh, and discover uh, a, a coherent conceptual framework that has depth and range possibility of elasticity but also practice it's a conceptual framework and practice and when we talk about ways of looking practice, practice, not just the idea of ways of looking it's the practice as we said so much, so many of these uh, modern philosophers completely lack any practice they might talk like Richard Rorty does about uh, uh, you know open to different ways of looking, which doesn't use that phrase, different views, keep the conversation going. But they have no way, as I've said this before, no way of actually um, practicing different ways of looking. So it's all just it's all just kind of empty rhetoric. And again you find there's there's actually very little offered. So Richard Rorty, and I think I've probably said this again, says Okay, so he's deconstructed this and that, and it's very, you know, good, e- excellent deconstruction of things to a certain extent. And he says, what we really need to do is keep the conversation going, keep the conversation going. And that's his ethical standpoint, keep the conversation going, or one of his main ethical standpoints. But there's no, but there is no conversation. There's just nothing to discuss. There's nothing offered. I can't take on other viewpoints to really engage in a conversation and I'm not really offering anything of myself because I have no framework because I have no dimensionality all this is connected so when we look back historically and I'm not a historian but when we look back historically um You can kind of see, I'm not sure it's the right word, we can kind of see different attempts, or maybe different ways, that's a better word, different ways in which um, ethics has been provided with a dimensionality, or different attempts um, at providing ethics with uh, dimensionality. Dimensionality would make sense of things, offer reasons for why, orient, um, help to adjudicate give justification, etc. So I just want to briefly mention them now, and then um, it's soon enough for today, so we'll um, come back to this hopefully in the next talk. Um, But so very briefly, um, to run through, we we could separate them out into four, um, looking historically, but uh, again, these are not separate actually, uh, nor are they simple. I'm not presenting them in a chronological order, nor, in fact, are they really even chronologically divided. It's more like they overlap and you get uh, different versions of this one, different variations sort of um, arising at diff- on different timelines. Um, there's modifications and all kinds of stuff. And they even, you get combinations as well. But if just very briefly now to mention them, so... <clears throat> Four kind of ways or attempts at providing a, a dimensionality or something that dimensionalizes and provides dimension for ethics. Another level, kind of recourse to another level order dimension. One is what we might call rationality. And so this goes back to 
I say Plato, maybe even Pythagoras, really, but um, <clears throat> and who knows where before that. But um, let's let's call it rationality. But the thing I want to say right now is that that's not a simple word. Okay, so um, a grounding of ethics in in rationality, because if you take four philosophers, Plato, Locke, Kant, and Hegel. Um, that word meant very different things. So for each of them, it was central into uh, central in their in their way of thinking about ethics. Plato, Locke, Kant, and Hegel. Rationality was central, but it meant something very, very different. Um, or, or at least there's two. Uh, there, there's two two main sort of ways it was thought about. At least lots of others as well, within, even within those four, but um, or some others within those four, but two main ways. In those ways, the main the main different meanings of, of the word rationality were connected with the second uh, way of giving dimensionality to uh, ethics, or providing a dimension which would give give make sense of ethics and uh, um, or help us orient. Um, and that is cosmic order, the order of the cosmos. Um, so, one old way of the ancient way, and actually, I'm not ancient, up to the Middle Ages, certainly, um, one way of uh, conceiving, but also sensing the cosmos, the world we live in, uh, and the whole cosmos, was that it had a hierarchical, a kind of vertical order. Of which that um, uh, hierarchy of angels I briefly alluded to earlier that would be part of it, and uh, there's a, there's a kind of hierarchical vertical order, um, you know, from the sort of ultimate levels of the Godhead, so to speak, the mystery of the divine, all the way down, so to speak, down to you know uh, the, the barest matter or whatever. Uh, so we can talk about things being closer to the divine or further away from the divine. It's complex, loads of different variations. So that's one way of thinking about the cosmic order. Another way of thinking about cosmic order, which <coughs> uh, came later, was as a much more horizontal structure. It's more like the co-functioning of parts. This, uh, so you can think of like, like the way an ecosystem works, or a machine works, actually. Or a clock works as has these different parts, and they're all kind of at the same level, and they function together the way they move together, the way they perhaps feed off each other or whatever functions. It's a kind of more a high, horizontal, let's say, order. Um, so we can have two ways of thinking about cosmic order, and in relationship to those two ways, two ways of uh, using either notion of order to ground a sense of dimensionality of ethics. I'm going to come back to this in a lot of detail. I'm just mentioning it now. Going back to the rationality uh, as, a, as a kind of attempt at dimensionalizing ethics, giving, or giving a dimension to support ethics, Plato thought of... What, Plato, what rationality meant to Plato meant more like um, seeing and sensing and... Uh, knowing, uncovering that vertical cosmic order and putting one's life um, in relationship to them. What is it, how should I say? Like, um, uh, orienting one's life toward that order and toward the hierarchy in that order. So one is, one is it's clear what is the highest good. And it's clear... Um, the kind of scale uh, or stairway that leads to it. And to be rational means to uncover that, to see it, to sense it, and to live one's, to think and to live one's life um, in accordance with what it naturally kind of suggests and demands. That's what it means for Plato to be rational. Um for someone like Locke, it meant something very different. It means something more akin to what we mean by it these days. It means just being something like logical. Okay. Uh, 
Hegel slightly different, Kant also different. So we will maybe go into this, uh, well, we will go into it more. So different kinds of rationality, different kinds of cosmic order, and what they suggest and, uh, about ethics and how they work um, in different ways to give a kind of support and dimensionalizing and sense-making to ethics. A third way of giving dimensionality to ethics is we could call, or has been sometimes called voluntarism, which is just basically saying, well, this is ethical because God said so, because God said it in the Bible, or in the Bible it says that God said so. And so there's a dimensionality there because God is, by definition, a being of a different order, of a different dimension, of a different level. And if God said so, then um, then it's God's will, God's voluntary. It's, uh, God has completely free will in this view. And so all that is, in the pure view, all that is grounding ethics is just because God said so. It has nothing to do with the structure of the universe, has nothing to do with human rationality, uh, or, or our logic being able to discover what the most ethical thing is. It's just God said so. God's at a different level, as it, God's a different dimension, therefore it gains its dimensionality through God's will. The voluntarism of, uh, is called in philosophy. God said so. And a fourth is, um, is basically uh, suffering. Or, or, or turn around and say happiness, and the kind of attempt to calculate or estimate, really, um, how much suffering this or that action would cause in comparison with this or with another action, um, how much happiness, and and try and ground ethics in in really in a notion of suffering and happiness. So do you see how each can kind of uh, makes its appeal, or had its appeal, as a dimension, by what I mean by a dimension. Um, there's, there is an appeal in each of these to something uh, kind of intrinsically sacred, meaningful, good, valuable, true, higher. Actually, not the last one. I'm including it right now, but not the last one. It's not really a dimension, that's part of its problem. Um, this what we call utilitarianism, just thinking, oh, well, suffering is the most important thing, reducing suffering is the most important thing, increasing happiness is the most important thing. We'll, we'll come back to this, I hope. But at least the other three, and in some way this fourth one, reducing suffering, increasing happiness, um, tries to um, kind of mask itself as if it were another dimension. <laughs> So each of them kind of has an appeal, there's an appeal to something intrinsically, as I said, sacred or good, ultimately valuable, meaningful, true, higher in some way. And that um, implies uh, or gives a why and a basis for ethics, whether it's an ethics of wrong or right or an ethics of what it's good to love, good to be. But each of these, rationality, cosmic order, voluntarism, um, what we call reduction of suffering, increase of happiness, each of these four um, has problems, ran into um, ways that it failed um, in the history of our, well, it, 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 there are places where it fails, let's put it that way. Uh, some would say they have failed um, historically or philosophically or whatever, but each of these brings problems, has problems. Um, there's places where it, it's easy to find where it, it just it doesn't function or it no longer functions, um, where uh, something becomes impossible. Let's see how we do it for time. Um, <clears throat> I think I'll stop there for today, and we'll go into this. I just want to mention these. These, these are the kinds of things that um, that have been attempted as ways of providing a dimensionality or uh, assumed uh, 
to provide a dimensionality to ethics. I mean, for you know, an example of, of a problem or a failure or impossibility was just that that notion of cosmic order after the Protestant Reformation, and then even more so with the scientific revolution, that that idea of a hierarchical order and an order of angels, it um, was either theologically um, brought into question and then more and more kind of... Um, it became more and more impossible to take it seriously as a reality as the scientific revolution uh, grew. So that would be an example of the, the, the crumbling and the disappearing of that as a, as a possible dimensionalizing or, or giving dimension to ethics. But I want to return to that as a possibility, in fact, in a different way. But as I said, each of them, we could go through each of them, it brings, brings, brings different problems. Um, but let's let's stop there for today. Thank you for listening. To learn how you can support the teachers and Dharma Seed, please visit dharmaseed.org slash donate.